by uh, a post by Laura Mulvey, who, if you if you are interested in film theory, you might know she's a she's quite a legendary feminist uh, film theorist who became famous in the 1970s with her theory on the male gaze in the narrative cinema. So how women in Hollywood were very much framed like objects for male pleasure. Uh, so that was kind of her, you know, what what I learned in film school about her. But in her latest book, After Images, she reflects a little bit on, on how the cinema culture has shifted in, you know, since the 70s. And uh, she writes about, in one of her essays, she writes about an Iranian, Iranian filmmaker, Rakshan Bani Etemat's film. And she asks the question, as silence is central to women's oppression under patriarchy, what form of language might adequately fill in for those silenced for so long? What mode of expression might bring the private silences into the public, public forum of culture? Keep that in mind for the discussion, but for now you might think Latvia, Iran, very different cultures, very different countries, what's the link? Well, I'd like to draw a parallel between Sisters in Longing, which we've just seen, and what Mulvey writes about the film by this Iranian filmmaker called The May Lady, which follows a middle-class, prize-winning documentary female filmmaker who is working on a film about the exemplary Iranian mother. But during the interview process, she uh, a painfully real and miserable condition of women in Iran becomes apparent. And so about this film, Mulvey writes this. Some try to tell their stories, but often their words fail in the face of the camera and the expectations it places on them, only recording their inability to speak. Relegated to the margins of society, they are living symptoms of society's true nature. The film bears witness to their unheard voices and the silence that envelops them. Sisters in Longing makes us into witnesses of this silence, as the film's protagonists are oppressed, traumatized, and destroyed by this silence. For being, from being told to keep silent about the abuse they've lived in their family, and to self-silencing, so self-censoring in the face of the camera because the pressure from judgment, from us, the viewers, is too much for them to bear. And as I said, this film has become very topical now in Latvia, although it was made back in, uh, if I'm not wrong, 2021, uh, because in April, a horrible murder happened in Latvia of a woman which kind of re-inflamed this whole discussion about, about uh, protecting our women and can Latvia protect our women? Um, and, and at the same time, the Istanbul Convention, which as you know, is not ratified in Latvia, although it has been signed in 2016, uh, also came into discussion of the public forum. Um, and unfortunately, although there are strong proponents for it, there's not enough political power to, to get it ratified. And in fact, the, the language that politicians use to kind of show their, um, the word, not non-support of this convention, is kind of weaponizing the language of it, especially the, the, the definition of social gender, and they're calling it the Trojan horse, that it's a manipulative convention that is going to uh, you know, endanger the morality of our children and the Latvian traditional values, which are based on the family, and the family in Latvian constitution actually is not, but they say it is defined as a union between a man and a woman and nothing else. So, it's kind of striking to, to, to see how powerful such a, su such a view on the convention is in Latvia and how much it, it, it resonates in, in public discourse. Uh, my husband showed me an article written, uh, published in uh, Oxford University Press, uh, so this year. It's called Continuity and Change in Human Rights Appropriation, the Case of Turkey, where they talk about human rights misappropriation so I'll have a little quote. Such efforts come, I'm sorry. 
Secondly, we might be observing a new phase in such contestation in recent times through consecrated efforts across the globe by conservative and religious actors to reverse previous human rights developments and commitments without overtly rejecting the language or institutions of human rights. So Latvians say, can we not protect our women ourselves? And look at Turkey, they have left the convention because they didn't want society to, to, to be ripped apart by it. I find that extremely backwards and dangerous as, as a discourse. So silence. In this film, we have seen that the condition of these women is, in my opinion, quite deplorable and the silence surrounding them is threefold. The silence of their families who do not support them, who leave them abandoned in these prisons, who in some cases don't care for the truth to be said, who prefer to keep, for whatever reason, the status quo. The silence of the state who does not support these women a lot, is, a lot is unsaid in this film, but I think it is clear that there are not enough structures to help people in crisis, to avoid having to take matters into their own hands. And the science, silence of society. So today there are not enough voices demanding change in Latvia. There are not enough people watching this movie and uh, not enough votes to ratify the convention. So coming back to Molly's original question, I'm very interested in this and I'd like to have your opinion too. What mode of expression, what else can we do to help these voices be heard? Thank you and uh, let's speak.